Well, hey, everybody, I'm Adam Shaw, the pastor at Melbourne Heights, and I want to welcome you as we come together to worship online today. And right now at Melbourne Heights, we are talking about what worship is all about. So over the course of the last couple of weeks, we have been trying to get back to the heart of worship, and we've been reminded that God is at the heart of our worship, the God who created the heavens and the earth and everything in them, including us, and the God who is active and present in our lives every moment of every day. And this God, of course, is a God who is worthy of our worship and our praise. But we can't stop with just praising God and celebrating what God is doing in our lives. There's another step that we need to take in our worship, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. But before we get to that, I want to take a minute to encourage you to engage with us throughout our time together today, because worship is about so much more than just watching a video for 45 minutes on a Sunday. So you can engage with us in a few ways. The first thing that I would like to ask you to do if you're worshiping with us on Facebook or on YouTube is to share this post and invite your friends to come and worship with us and to come and worship with you today. You can also engage with us by using the comments thread that you find on Facebook or on YouTube or the chat button you find on our church website, and we would love to have a conversation with you. So feel free to ask questions, make comments, and just start that conversation with us. You can also engage with us if you're on Facebook right now by using the emojis that you find there to let us know when you like something that was said, if you love a song that we sing, or if something that we say makes you laugh or think a little bit differently today. And also feel free to use those praising hands or to use the praying hands, again, just as a way to let us know that you're here and engaged inside of our worship service. And yes, we know that these aren't the same things as we're being able to worship God together in person inside of the same room, but all of these things do remind us that we are still worshiping a God who is so great that he can reach out to all of us no matter where we are today. Now, in just a minute, I'm going to turn it over to Leslie and our church musician as they lead us in worship through song, but first, let me invite you to join with me in a word of prayer. Let's pray together. God, we are so thankful for the chance that we have right now just to come together to worship you, God, because you are God. You are an awesome God. You are the God who created the heavens and the earth and everything in them, and that includes us. But God, you did more than just create us. You are still active and present in our lives every moment of every day. So God, we come together now to worship you to praise you, to celebrate everything that you have done, everything that you are doing, and everything that you will do in our lives. So let us set all, everything else aside and focus in on you today. Let us feel your presence and hear a word from you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning and happy Valentine's Day. Let's praise the Lord together.
So we have now been worshiping together online for almost 11 months. But there's one topic that we haven't talked about a whole lot over the course of the last 11 months. Even though we have been coming together to worship every single week on our church's website or on our Facebook page or on our YouTube channel, we haven't spent a whole lot of time talking about what worship really is. So over the last couple of weeks, that's what we've been doing here at Melbourne Heights. We've been talking about what worship is all about. And together, together we have been trying to get back to the heart of worship. So over the last couple of weeks, we've been reminded that the heart of our worship is God. The heart of our worship is God. So two weeks ago, we spent our time together talking about who our God is. And together we saw that our God, our God is an awesome God. Our God is a God that nothing is too big for, but our God is also a God that nothing is too small for. And perhaps the most amazing thing about our God is that our God is present and active in our lives every single moment of every single day. And when we realize that God is present in our lives, we want to worship God. We want to worship God. But how do we do that? How do we worship God? 
Well, we started talking about that last week. And last week we saw that the first thing that we want to do when we realize that God is present and active in our lives is that we want to praise God. And praising God is about letting nothing stand between you and God. So when you praise God, you're going to sing, even if you can't carry a tune in a bucket. And when you praise God, you are going to dance, even if you have two left feet. And when you praise God, you are going to let go of anything and let go of everything that stands between you and God. And you're going to celebrate. You're going to celebrate like your favorite team just won the Super Bowl last Sunday. But praising God? Praising God is only part of how we worship God. So today, we're going to talk about another important aspect of our worship. But before we start talking about this other important aspect of our worship, I need to give you a little warning right now. Last week, when we started talking about how we respond to God's presence in our lives, we spent our time together talking about the fun stuff. I mean, think about it for a minute. Praising God is fun because it's fun to smile, and it's fun to laugh, and it's fun to sing, and it's fun to dance, and it's fun to look back and see how God has been present in your life, and it's fun to celebrate all that God has done for you. But what we're going to be talking about today, it isn't very fun. What we're going to be talking about today is actually pretty hard. What we're going to be talking about today is probably going to hurt your feelings, at least a little bit. What we're going to be talking about today is probably going to step on your toes. And if it doesn't, then you're probably not listening to what I'm saying. But you need to hear this. I need to hear this. We all need to hear this. Because when we recognize that God is present and active in our lives, it must remind us of what matters the most to God. And it must force us to make our priorities line up with God's priorities. Worship must make our priorities line up with God's priorities. And if our priorities aren't lining up with God's priorities, then we're not really worshiping God. So today, we're going to be talking about God's priorities. But what are they? What are God's priorities? What matters the most to God? Well, if you've spent much time in the church over the years, and you've attended a whole lot of worship services, then you start making some assumptions about what really matters the most to God. And you're likely going to assume that the things that matter the most to God are the things that we typically do during our worship services when we come together each week. After all, if the things that we do during our worship services don't matter to God, to the God that we're worshiping, then why do we do them in the first place? So that means that we're going to assume that sermons matter a lot to God because we have a sermon every week. And we're going to assume that songs and singing matter a lot to God because we have songs and we sing every week. And we're going to assume that saying prayers and collecting offerings matter a lot to God because we say prayers and we collect an offering every week. We're going to assume that sitting still and being on our best behavior matters a lot to God because that's what we've been told we're supposed to do when we come to worship. But if these are the assumptions that we make, that these are the things that matter the most to God, we're going to be wrong. If you think the things that matter the most to God are the things that happen inside our church during a worship service, then you're going to be wrong. Are your feelings starting to hurt a little bit yet? Are your toes starting to get a little bit sore? If they are, i got bad news for you. We're not even close to being done yet. So the things that we do in our worship service aren't what really matters to God. Then what does? What matters to God? Well, I want you to hear what really matters to God straight from the source. I want you to hear it straight from God. In Isaiah chapter 57, God tells us what really matters to him. But before we start reading from the book of Isaiah together, let me set the stage for you just a little bit right now. Isaiah is what we call a prophet, which is a fancy way of saying that Isaiah is someone who speaks on behalf of God. And in the passage that we're going to be looking at in just a minute, 
Isaiah is delivering a very specific message on God's behalf. When this passage was written, the people of Israel were in the middle of a huge time of transition. Decades earlier, the people of Israel had been defeated by the Babylonian Empire, and they had been exiled throughout that empire. But now, as this passage of Scripture is picking up, the Babylonians have fallen to the Persian Empire. And the king of Persia, he is getting ready to let the people of Israel return to their homes. So the people of Israel, they have felt God's presence in their lives. They have seen God act through the king of Persia. And the people of Israel will soon be on their way home. And when they get home, they want to do what we all want to do when we realize that God is present and active in our lives. The people of Israel want to go back home and worship God. But the people of Israel have been gone for so long that they don't know how to behave when they get back home. So the people of Israel are trying to figure out how to worship God once they return to Israel. And God? Well, God wants to weigh in on their decision. And God wants to weigh in on their decision because God has been paying careful attention to how the people of Israel have been worshiping him. And we'll just let God explain how he feels about the way that the people of Israel have been worshiping him. So let's take a look at Isaiah chapter 58, and we're going to start reading together with verse 1. Here's what it says. Shout with the voice of a trumpet blast. Shout aloud. Don't be timid. Tell my people Israel of their sins. Yet they act so pious. They come to the temple every day and seem delighted to learn all about me. They act like a righteous nation that would never abandon the laws of its God. They ask me to take action on their behalf, pretending they want to be near me. We have fasted before you, they say. Why aren't you impressed? We have been very hard on ourselves, and you don't even notice it. I will tell you why, I respond. It's because you are fasting to please yourselves. So it's pretty clear in these couple of verses that God is getting angry with the people of Israel for the way that they've been worshiping him. And the people of Israel aren't going to like it when God's angry. But God's getting angry with them because even though the people of Israel seem to be doing everything right, they really aren't. The people of Israel are doing everything we may associate with worship. I mean, they are going to the temple every single day, and the people of Israel are praying, and they are petitioning God. And the people of Israel are fasting for God, which is an act of worship that few of us have ever even tried. But God sees through everything that they're doing. God knows that even though the people of Israel have been coming to the temple, and that even though the people of Israel have been praying and petitioning God, and that even though the people of Israel have been fasting, they still don't have the same priorities that God has. Everything that the people of Israel has been doing has been all about them. They were showing up at the temple to please themselves. They had been praying and petitioning God to please themselves. They had been fasting to please themselves. When it came to worship, their priority wasn't God. Their priority was themselves. But God, God's about to remind the people of Israel what his priorities are. So let's pick back up at the beginning of verse 3. Here's what it says. We have fasted before you, they say. Why aren't you impressed? We have been very hard on ourselves, and you don't even notice it. I will tell you why, I respond. It's because you were fasting to please yourselves. Even while you fast, you keep oppressing your workers. What good is fasting when you keep on fighting and quarreling? This kind of fasting will never get you anywhere with me. You humble yourselves by going through the motions of penance, bowing your heads like reeds bending in the wind. You dress in burlap and cover yourselves with ashes. Is this what you call fasting? 
Do you really think this will please the Lord? No. This is the kind of fasting I want. Free those who are wrongly imprisoned. Lighten the burden of those who work for you. Let the oppressed go free and remove the chains that bind people. Share your food with the hungry and give shelter to the homeless. Give clothes to those who need them and do not hide from relatives who need your help. Then your salvation will come like the dawn and your wounds will quickly heal. Your godliness will lead you forward and the glory of the Lord will protect you from behind. So did you hear it? Did you hear what God's priorities really are? Did you hear what matters the most to God? Well, listen to it again. God says, this is the kind of fasting I want. Free those who are wrongly imprisoned. Lighten the burden of those who work for you. Let the oppressed go free and remove the chains that bind people. Share your food with the hungry and give shelter to the homeless. Give clothes to those who need them. Do not hide from relatives who need your help. But wait, I don't want to stop with Isaiah chapter 58 because I could always just be cherry picking a passage that makes the point I want to make today. But there are plenty of other passages throughout the Bible that make this exact same point. So let's look at another one of them that we find in Micah chapter 6. And let's see what Micah says. Here's what it says. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? Did you hear it? When Micah asked, what does the Lord require of you? God answers. And God doesn't say anything about listening to sermons. And God doesn't say anything about saying your prayers. And God doesn't say anything about singing hymns. When Micah asked, what does the Lord require of you? God told him to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Let's not stop there either, because I want you to see how important these things are to God. So let's look at Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. It says, I want you to show love, not offer sacrifices. I want you to know me more than I want burnt offerings. So God doesn't want sacrifices or burnt offerings. God wants us to show love. And let's keep going. Let me give you one more example today. And this one comes straight from the mouth of Jesus. Jesus, who is God made human, tells us what God's priorities are. And we even talked about what Jesus says here just a couple of weeks ago. But when Jesus was asked what the greatest commandment in all of the law is, Jesus said, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. So when you take what we read in the book of Isaiah, And when you take that and you add to that what we read from Micah and Hosea, and then when you add on what we just heard Jesus say, these passages make it crystal clear what our priorities have to be. If you really want to worship God, then God comes first, other people come second, and you come last. If you want to worship God, then God comes first, Other people come second, and you come last. So how are you doing on that? How are you doing on that? Now, I've got to be completely honest with you today. I'm pretty bad at it. 
I am pretty bad at putting myself last and putting God and other people first. I am. And why am I so bad at it? Well, I'm bad at it because I want my life to be easy. I want my life to be enjoyable. I want to do things the way that I want to do them when I want to do them. But let me tell you something. When you start putting yourself last, God can do some amazing things through you. Let me give you an example. A few years ago, I ran across a study that was conducted by one of the largest Christian publishing houses in the world, LifeWay Research. And in this study, LifeWay was working to determine why people continue to come back to the same church more than one time. And that study found that up to 90% of people return to a church because of the preaching. Well, when I first read that study, we weren't exactly having a lot of people that were coming to Melbourne Heights for the first time, and we were having even fewer people who were coming back for a second time. So when I looked at that research and I looked at that information, I realized that it had something to do with me. Now, at that point, I had been preaching for almost a decade. So I had preached somewhere in the ballpark of 500 sermons. And I got to be honest with you, I liked the way that I preached. I had my manuscript in front of me. I knew everything that I was going to say, and I knew exactly how long it would take for me to say it. So if I put myself first, nothing would have changed. I would still be preaching the exact same way that I had been for the previous 10 years, and we would probably have fewer people that were tuned into this worship service right now. But instead, I made a decision. I made a decision to listen to the research, to put the needs of other people first, and to make some changes to my preaching style. Even though it meant that I was going to be doing things differently than I had learned to do them over the course of a decade in ministry. And even though it meant that I was going to be adding at least a couple of hours to my sermon preparation every single week. I did it. I made those changes, and I did it because of God's priorities. God comes first, other people come second, and I come last. And through this change in preaching style, I have heard from many of you that you have heard some of the most life-changing sermons you have ever heard over the last couple of years. And I also see the difference that it's made when I look at how many people are regularly joining us for worship on our church website or on our Facebook page or on YouTube or listening in to one of our sermon podcasts. And I can tell you today that our church now regularly and consistently ministers to people not just all around our state, but all around our country and all around the world. But none of that would have happened if I didn't recognize God's priorities and change my priorities. So here's my question for you today. When was the last time that you put yourself last? When was the last time that you put the wants, the desires, the needs of someone else before your own? If it's been a while, you need to realize that if you always come first, then God always comes last. If you always come first, then God always comes last. And you'll never get any closer to God if God always comes last. You'll never worship God if God always comes last. So it's time to put God and other people first. It's time to rearrange our priorities. It's time to change. We have a word for that in church. And that word is penance. And penance is recognizing that God's priorities aren't our priorities, and then doing something to change our priorities. So here's my challenge for you this week. I want you to take a long, hard look at yourself and see where you put yourself first, and then do something to change it. It's that simple, but it's also that difficult. But if you do it, if you do it, you will learn the most important thing that you can learn in worship. You will learn to put God's priorities ahead of your own. And when you put God's priorities ahead of your own, 
you will really be worshiping God the way that God wants you to worship him. And when you put God's priorities ahead of your own, you will have found the heart of worship. Let's pray together. God, we thank you so much for the chance that we've had over the last few weeks to re-examine and to try to remember what the heart of worship is all about, God. And the heart of worship is all about you, God. A God that is so great that you created the heavens and the earth and everything in them, but a God that is so up close and personal that you made us and you are present and active in our lives every moment of every day, God. So God, you are a God who is worthy of our worship, a God that we need to celebrate. But God, we can't stop with just praising you. We also have to make sure that we are becoming more like you, that we are aligning our priorities with your priorities, and not the other way around. So God, help us to put you first, to put other people next, and to put ourselves last. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, at this point in the service each week, we put this slide up on the screen to let you know how you can financially support the work and the ministry of Melvin Heights. And a lot of what we do at this church is what we have just been talking about. We work to put God first, other people second, and ourselves last. One of the ways that we've been doing that over the course of this pandemic is by working with the Cabbage Patch Settlement House to make sure that their pantry continues to be stocked for people inside of our own community who are hurting or in need. So if you would like to help us as we keep the pantry stocked through donations of personal hygiene items or non-perishable food items, you can bring those donations by our church offices at any point. You can also give specifically to the Cabbage Patch House through our church website, or you can just give to our general fund and support all of the work and the ministry that we continue to do here. If you'd like to do that, just visit mhbclouisville.com slash give. Now let me turn it back over to Leslie and our musician as they lead us in our closing song. When the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come, longing just to
happy Valentine's Day. Let's praise the Lord together.
Before we go, I just want to take a second to thank you for joining us for worship today. It really does mean a lot to us that you spent part of your day with us. And if you have been blessed by our time together today, let me encourage you to do a couple of things before we go. The first thing I want to ask you to do, if you haven't already done so and you're joining us on Facebook or on YouTube, is to share this post and invite your friends to come back and watch a replay of this service. Also, if you're joining us on Facebook right now, let me ask you to hit the like button for our page. And if you're on YouTube, subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you know whenever we have a new worship service or midweek devotional or kids story time or anything else that you can be a part of. I also want to take just a second right now and let you know that this is the end of our Heart of Worship worship series. So we're going to be starting into something brand new next week. And we are actually entering into a season that we in the church call Lent. And Lent is a time where we reprioritize, where we focus back in on God and the weeks that are leading up to Easter. And all of that actually kicks off before next Sunday rolls around. It all kicks off on Wednesday night. And this Wednesday night at 6 o'clock, we are going to have a special Ash Wednesday service on our Facebook page, on our YouTube channel, and on our church website. So let me encourage you to come back and join us for that live worship service as we kick off this season and reprioritize putting God first in our lives. Now, that's all that we've got for you today, so let me invite you to join with me one more time in a word of prayer before we finish up. Let's pray together. God, again, we do just thank you so much for the chance that we've had over the last few weeks to think about what worship is all about. And we thank you for the reminders that you are the heart of worship, God. So let us praise you and let us align our priorities with yours, God. Let us love you. Let us love others. And let us always stay focused on you. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. So don't forget, come back and join us Wednesday night for our special Ash Wednesday service, and that will be a communion service, so make sure that you have your, your crackers, your juice, whatever else you may need. And then we will see you back here on Sunday morning as we start into a series for the season of Lent where we're going to be exploring some of the events that took place on Holy Week. So look forward to worshiping with you a few more times over the course of the next week. And until we see you guys again, I hope that you guys have a great week, and I can't wait to worship with you soon.